listening to Everlasting Ministries, equipping Christians through media. Get ready as we dive into the Word with my husband, Pastor Eric Ureen, as he preaches from Riverside Christian Church in Roseville, California. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then he created man and saw man was lonely and so he put him to sleep and took his rib and made woman. And they were having a great time in the garden and they were in the presence of God. And of course there were two trees, uh, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the only thing they couldn't do was eat of the knowledge of good and evil. And one day the, the serpent, right, Satan who's the top dog when it comes to the rebellion against God. Satan came and tempted Eve with that fruit and she took of the fruit and Adam took of it as well. It was Adam's responsibility to watch over and tend to that garden. We don't know how long the serpent was there when he came in, but he came in on Adam's watch and as the husband, as the man who was supposed to watch over and protect his wife, it's easy to say, Oh, the woman messed up because she ate the apple, but the serpent was there. And at some point, Adam allowed him to be there. And instead of confronting him and kicking him out, he was passive. He allowed him to be there. And of course, when they took of that fruit, the consequences of sin was death. And they became aware of their nakedness. I I think of uh, when you look at some of the Hebrew words there to describe that, it's almost as if they, they took on flesh, they went from a place of never dying, being eternal, no death, to suddenly this law of death, this death force, a second law of thermodynamics, entropy comes into play, and then everything starts to die. And we see the unwinding of everything. And the amazing thing to me is when we go out and we look at nature, Uh, the ocean, and when we see these beautiful things, everything we see right now is in a fallen state. So imagine the beauty of the garden. If we can see such beauty in what is in the state of fallen nature, which Jesus, right, he's not only redeeming us, he's redeeming his creation as well. How beautiful that place must have been. And the drastic change Adam and Eve experienced once that death force came into play. They had pains. They had to suffer. They had to work the land for food. They became aware of their nakedness, finding leaves to hide themselves from God. And of course, the first shedding of blood was them uh, killing animals for their skins to cover their nakedness. And then we move on from there and we see the first prophecy of Scripture is God prophesying about Jesus Christ and how his heel would be bruised and crushed the head of the serpent. And so we fast forward ahead and when that prophecy was fulfilled, when Jesus died on the cross, right? He was man and he was sinless and he was the perfect sacrificial lamb and his heel crushed the head of the serpent. So like we talked a couple weeks ago, when we encounter the devil in our lives, if you look closely, stamped on his forehead is... Do not worry, Jesus has overcome. Victory lies ahead. Because Jesus has overcome. And his blood that was shed for us is the sacrificial offering that brings us back into reconciliation with him. So tonight, I want to look at what it means to be a Christian. And so along with applying this to our own life and recognizing where we are at, Also thinking of those that we love and that we know who aren't believers. When I was a kid, I went to a church and they had a little acronym for gospel. Maybe some of you remember this. The the gospel is about God. The gospel is for ourselves. The gospel is about a savior. The gospel is powerful. The gospel must be embraced. And the gospel is life-altering. The gospel isn't just a message but the gospel is also a man, God's eternal son, Jesus Christ. And he began this public ministry by calling people to repentance. 
It's interesting when we look at history of all the great revivals that have broken out. They always started out with repentance. And repentance is a key in the Christian walk. Mark 1, 14 through 15, this is pretty much the, uh, the, the first public account. Today, I guess you could say the first time Jesus showed up on TV. This was his, his grand opening. Mark 1, 14 through 15. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So the first thing he throws out there is repent, followed by believe in the gospel. In the Greek, the word used there for repent is actually taken from two words that literally mean a changing of the mind. Many times we read in Scripture, right, the renewing of the mind. We pray for the renewing of the mind. The word repent there means to literally change the mind. True repentance will change our mind. And in looking through Scripture, I found three ways that that changing of the mind occurs. Number one, the changing of our mind about God. Who is God? Number two, the changing of our mind about the human condition, where we are at and why we are here. And number three, the changing of our mind concerning what it takes to come into a relationship with God. Repentance is accepting the truth of who God is, who we are, and what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. Repentance requires us to respond accordingly. Our response is the acknowledgement that our sins are real, that we are separated from a holy God, and we deserve judgment. Jesus is the only way to the Father. He is our only hope. We cannot save ourselves, but Jesus can save us. And the great thing is, not only can he save us, he wants to save us. Right? He wants to do that. For everybody. So look at John 1, 12 through 13. But to as many as did receive and welcome him, who is Jesus, he gave the right, which means the authority and the privilege, to become children of God. That is to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely upon his name, the name of Jesus, who were born not of blood, which means natural conception, nor of the will of the flesh, which means a physical impulse, nor of the will of man, and that is the man meaning the natural, your natural father, but of God. That is a divine and supernatural birth. They are born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed, and sanctified. Amen? Amen. One of the things I want to look at there, to become children of God. So it takes an action to transform from a creation of God to a child of God. The action, he says, is receiving and welcoming Jesus Christ, that through him, he gives the right, which is, that right there is a, the legal term right, the legal authority to become a child of God through Jesus Christ. Two passages I want to look at on how we as followers of Jesus Christ are to live in a world of bad news, in difficult circumstances, which is temporary because Jesus Christ is returning again one day and he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he will rule and reign forevermore and we won't have to worry about fake news anymore. <laughs> 1 Peter 2, 9-12 through 12. However, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people who belong to God. You were chosen to tell about the excellent qualities of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not God's people, but now you are. Once you were not shown mercy, but now you have been shown mercy. Dear friends, since you are foreigners and temporary residents of this world, I'm glad I'm a temporary resident, I'm encouraging you to keep away from the desires of your corrupt nature. These desires will constantly attack you, but live decent lives among unbelievers. 
Then, although they ridicule you as if you were doing wrong, while they are watching you do good things, they will praise God on the day He comes to help you. A couple of things I want to highlight there. Temporary residents of this world. The trials, the tribulations, the pains, the heartaches, everything we're dealing with right now is temporary. Amen? It's not eternal. Then the other side, these desires will constantly attack you. So we're going to have to deal with them. So when you're facing those desires, when they come at you after a while, don't be discouraged that, that they're there. But to know that you have victory in Jesus Christ to overcome. 1 Peter 3, 15 through 17. But dictate your lives to Christ as Lord. There again, everybody loves the Savior part, now everybody wants the Lord part. But dictate your lives to Christ as Lord. Always be ready to defend your confidence in God when anyone asks you to explain it. So how often are we supposed to be ready when somebody asks us about our faith in God? Always. Always be ready. However, make your defense with gentleness and respect. That can be hard sometimes because we can get sucked into arguments and stuff. But we need to make our defense with gentleness and respect, keeping our conscience clear. Then those who treat the good Christian life you live with contempt will feel ashamed that they have ridiculed you. After all, if it is God's will, it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing wrong. So if it's God's will, it's better to suffer. Uh oh. Suffer. It's, it's unavoidable in the Christian life. But it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing wrong. Amen. Sometimes we need to remember we've got to push through to get to. When God's calling us somewhere, sometimes we've got to push through something to get there. Sometimes in order to get the answered prayer, sometimes it'll come instantly, and other times there'll be something we've got to push through in order to get to that. But the pushing through is a necessity, and God is going to use it to mold us for a reason. We've got to have faith. We've got to have faith to get through. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. You received Christ Jesus the Lord. There we go, Lord again. So continue to live as Christ's people. Sink your roots in him and build on him. Be strengthened by faith that you were taught and overflow with thanksgiving. Faith. We need to lift up that shield. We need to pray that the Lord will help develop that shield of faith to be equipped and refined for the things we need to pass through and to be overflowing with thanksgiving. Overflowing means you're not just thankful for yourself where it's keeping your own cup full, right? It means that thanksgiving is going to spill out of that cup and pour into the lives of others around you. Luke 17, 5 and 6. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith which means our ability to confidently trust in God and in His power. And the Lord said, If you have confident, abiding faith in God, as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, which mulberry trees, by the way, were known to have really strong roots, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea. And if the request was in agreement with the will of God, it will have to obey you. When we merge our confidence, our abiding faith in God with the agreement of God's will, supernatural things will happen. And that's why it becomes important to know the Word of God and to hear the Lord's voice. When the Lord calls us to do something, I can have that supernatural faith in moving forward in that area because I'm coming in agreement with what He wants. When I know what the promises are in Scripture and I move accordingly to those promises in Scripture, I can have that supernatural faith and experience those supernatural results because I'm not only praying and having faith, I'm walking in the will that God has. I recall many times in my life when I have seen the miracle things, the tumors disappear, the legs grow, those physical supernatural things. Every time I heard from the Lord clear direction, and I knew it was God's will, and 
because of that, I also had my faith level was higher because I know when God promises something, it's going to happen because I've experienced it so many times in my life. So my faith level increased. I merged with God's will, and the miracle happens. But with this faith, talking about faith, it's important. We all need to get this. So listen carefully. Faith in Jesus Christ isn't the finish line. It's the starting line for the race. Sometimes we get twisted in our thinking. We say, oh, if we just if we have faith in Jesus Christ, then I just cross the goal line. But it's the start of the race that he has laid out before us. We start by repenting and believing in the good news of Jesus Christ. Then as his disciples, we heed Jesus' call to follow him as the chief shepherd. We know faith without works is dead. When we follow Jesus, we will always have the opportunity to put faith into action and let faith come alive when we hear his voice and come in agreement with his will, when we let him be the Lord, the good shepherd, and the savior of our lives. We need to follow the shepherd. We talked about that a couple weeks back, about the importance of the shepherd and who is the shepherd and the qualities of Jesus Christ as the shepherd. Mark 1, 17, And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Breaking that down, which means, as my disciples, accepting me as your master and teacher and walking the same path of life that I walk. It means we walk with him. We are accepting and identify the salvation he offers. So we don't just accept it. We need to identify it, to know what it covers. And that also gives us the ability to articulate that to others who are not saved. So it's more than just accepting it. We need to identify what that is. And, and the third one is we need to be identified as a follower of Christ. So unless we all walk around with our Jesus t-shirts and stuff on, what is it that we do and how do we conduct ourselves to the degree where somebody can see us as a follower of Christ without holding up a sign or carrying a Bible in our arms? That's a challenge to us. That should compel us to live and walk out a certain way. That someone should be able to identify me as a Christian, and if not a Christian, at least sense the presence of God and that there is something different that compels them to want to know. Another thing, John 14, 6, which was kind of an interesting side note because I, I like these little tidbits. This is the sixth of the I am statements that Jesus Christ gave in Scripture. Six is the number of man and means imperfect man. So, kind of cool, knowing this and reading this, Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life no one comes to the Father but by me. It's not just I am the way and the truth. Those Greek words there are very authoritative. It means I am the only way to God. I am the real truth. I am the real life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And of course, that's the, the sixth I am, which is a direct statement to the need for imperfect man fallen man, to come to him, that he is the way of salvation. Now the enemy will come to us trying to get us to doubt our salvation in life. And these are just four of some of the ones that come to my mind right away that I've dealt with. Number one is when struggles come in life, we can doubt our salvation, but the Bible never guarantees an easy life for God's people. So don't let the devil get you to doubt your salvation just because your life isn't easy. In fact, I've said before, I would be nervous if you never come face to face with the devil in your life because you just might be walking the same direction. We can expect resistance when we are walking towards God because the devil is walking away from God trying to bring people in the opposite direction. Number two, fluctuating feelings. I'm a very emotional guy, so there have definitely been times in my life I've dealt with this, but fluctuating feelings can sway us to think or doubt our salvation or where we are in our walk. But the reality is, is that the Bible says we need to live 
by what God says, because what God says is true, not by what seems to be true, because of our feelings. The authoritative word of God, he is truth, period. Don't let our feelings dictate what truth is. And number three, falling back into sin, stumbling. But failures don't make us non-believers. They actually prove how much more we need Jesus. When we fall, like we talked about, the good shepherd, one of the responsibilities of the shepherd is to watch. When sheep fall, especially on their backs, a lot of the time they can't get back up. It requires a shepherd to help them back up on their feet. Otherwise, they struggle and they eventually die of dehydration. So it's okay when we fall. Ask the Lord is there to help us. Ask for repentance. Got to repent. Help me, Jesus. The Lord's there to help stand us back up on our feet and we move forward. But just because we may fall or do something stupid, which I've done tons of stupid things in my life, don't let it get to your head and make you doubt your salvation or make you doubt that God is no longer there for you because right, God is there for his children. He never leaves us and he never forsakes us. And the fourth one is telling us lies. And we know that the enemy is the father of lies. The voice of lies isn't God's voice. So when those times come, we need to pick up our shield of faith and come against the father of lies. You ignore the lies or you tell the lies to shut up, kick them out the door, whatever it is, however you feel like God is dealing, getting, wanting you to deal with it, you, you deal with it. You deal with it by just ignoring it and you just keep moving on looking towards Jesus or you deal with it by kicking him out the door. But either way, you pick up the shield of faith and you utilize that to silence the lies. And then, of course, genuine faith in Jesus Christ takes us from being spiritually blind to having spiritual vision. Genuine faith in Jesus Christ takes us from being at war with God to being a friend with God. We go from being impure to being clean and washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We move from condemnation and wrath to a pardon and being blessed. For Jesus doesn't appoint his children unto wrath. We go from stumbling in the darkness to walking in the light. We go from being in debt to being ransomed and redeemed. Amen. We go from being a slave to sin to being set free in Christ who overcame sin. And from being exempt from God's kingdom to becoming a citizen of heaven. We go from being lost to being found. Amen. I'm so glad I am found. So in closing, I want to ask us these questions. What would you say to someone who asked you to explain your faith. Do you know if I was to walk up to you or someone off the street was to just walk up to you? Do you know how to give them that answer? How to explain your faith? Is there a difference between believing things about Jesus and believing in Jesus? I've met a lot of people who call themselves Christians and when you actually ask them who Jesus is to them, you'll find out He's a good teacher. He's one of many ways. He forgives all sins, and so we can just do whatever we want because his grace covers everything. You, you, whenever you ask someone, who is Jesus to you? And immediately, you will know exactly where they are in life because they will tell you, you know, he's, he, was a good, oh, he was a good teacher, or he's Lord and Savior, or don't talk to me about that. I mean instantly from that question you will be able to know how what the next step of the conversation is going to be from that that simple question and so is there a difference between believing things about Jesus and believing in Jesus and where do you find yourself in the answer to that question <laughs> Thank you for listening. We pray this sermon was a blessing to you. May your faith be strengthened in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For more information, visit us at our website at www.everlastingministries.com.